All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Who Knew in the Moment the podcast. Today, I am honored to have Josh Dotzler with me. Josh is the CEO of Abide Network in Omaha, Nebraska, uh, and their mission is a big one, and you're going to hear a lot about what they're doing to cultivate uh, relationships and change uh, neighborhoods inside of Omaha. One thing that stood out to me about Josh and one of his missions, I'm going to read it verbatim so I don't mess this up, uh, but his goal is to ignite change and inspire individuals to use their God-given influence to see God-sized impact. And uh, he's going to talk about what he's been able to accomplish or what they've been able to accomplish, but it's impressive things. So Josh, thanks so much for being on today. Hey, man, it's good to be with you. I love hearing that description. Whoever wrote that or whoever said that, I want to get to know that person because that's pretty inspirational. <laughs> I love that. I'm over here saying, oh, that's good. That's good. <laughs> oh, that's perfect. Well, good. So, Josh, to start with your story, uh, you know, I'd be missing the boat if I didn't start with your parents. And yeah. so, you know, with your parents' story, um, they were living in a, kind of the outskirts part of the nicer parts of Omaha and then uh, one day felt compelled to switch the landscape in which they live so talk a little yeah. bit about that because that was during your childhood I mean that, that, that was huge and uh, honestly it goes a lot with what your podcast is all about and just how different moments define our lives and who would have known in the moment so when I was two our, my dad was a chemical engineer. We lived in the Millard, Omaha area. You know, he would say that he was successful, great job, just built a brand new house, yeah. was a part of a church. Uh, and, you know, he just, he, he felt like, number one, we believe that everyone has a purpose. And he felt like he wasn't fully living in his purpose, had a good yeah. job, but he felt like he was called to do more. And um, so he quit his job. And, uh, he basically, him and my mom opened the newspaper one day and said, we'll, we'll go anywhere in, in the city or beyond, except for North Omaha. <laughs> and uh, if you're listening outside of Omaha, North Omaha is an area known for crime and violence. And my dad's a white guy from rural Iowa, population 300. My mom's from Washington, D.C., African-American. And um, I mean, my, my moving into an all, you know, or predominantly black community was foreign territory for my dad. Yeah. And so uh, he, he, he said they, they, after quitting their job and the house opened up in North Omaha, they moved into North Omaha. And my dad would say within the first two weeks, he saw more police, more crime and violence than he had ever seen in his entire life. And he knew he was supposed to be a part of the solution in some way. So he started our, our nonprofit Abide and it was kind of the beginning of uh, where we are today and was real pivotal Again, for me, I was young, so I really grew up in North Omaha. Yeah. But in hearing the story and just uh, you know being in a lot of different spaces and places with leaders, started to understand the sacrifice that my parents made, and just how their life they wanted to live again around this idea of purpose. Yeah. And regardless of what it would cost them, so that definitely started to shape me and, and impacted my life at a young age. Absolutely. Now, something else that really impacted your life uh, is this game of basketball. Yeah. So talk a little bit about how you got introduced to basketball. And, you know, if there's a certain moment that you really remember being like, man, I love this game. Yeah. Well, I mean, honestly, it goes back to my parents. Yeah. And so my parents met in college. They went to a small school in Tarkio, Missouri. They were both there on a basketball scholarship. And my dad ended up getting hurt. He starts helping the women's team, meets my mom, the rest is history. But I would say this, my parents are some of the most competitive people <laughs> I've ever met. And so growing up, we, I mean, we grew up in a, in a, in a, in an environment that was highly competitive. Everything was a competition, the games. Yeah. Uh, and then also my parents love basketball. And so I was one of, I'm one of 14 kids. Yes. You know, when I was younger, there was five and then it, it kept growing. I think when I was in college, my parents went to 20 basketball games over one weekend <laughs> and they would have probably went to 20 more uh, if they could have. Yeah. And yeah. so it was like, faith is going to be important. The mission is going to be important and basketball is going to be important in our, in our family. And so yeah. the reality is different uh, you know, siblings, I think were gifted in different ways and liked yeah. it in different ways. For me, I mean, ever since I was young, three years old, it was just something that I, I love doing. 
And uh, my mom actually is the one who taught me how to dribble through my legs and around my yeah. back. And so having two parents that were constantly fueling it, being around the game, having, I had two older brothers, there was always competition. It was something I knew I wanted to do at a young age. Uh, and then by the grace of God, he had gifted me enough to where, you know, as I got older, went to high school, uh, was able to be on a team, went back-to-back state championships, had a lot of success, got a scholarship to play at Creighton when I was a sophomore uh, in high school, committed there, and uh, was getting recruited by Nebraska and Kansas and a few other schools, but Creighton being so close to home went there and was excited about that, and, and uh, my freshman year in college ended up getting hurt and uh, stole the ball, got tripped from behind, and uh, it, it, it definitely shifted a lot of my life. But basketball was such a huge part of our family. Yeah. And then it became a huge part of my journey towards success and just discipline and teamwork as I, as I kind of grew up and got older. Yeah. So something that I don't want to just skip over here in those yeah. high school years is uh, one, you're the youngest at that time, youngest player to ever commit or sign with Creighton. Yeah. And so talk a bit about that. I mean, yeah. I'm sure that is a pressure decision or feels a little bit of pressure. Um, and there's still a lot of time that could have passed to change your mind, but you're a, yeah. you're a man of your word and you talked about that. So talk a little bit about what went into that decision and how you still had the confidence that that was the right choice. Even as things changed, you became yeah two time state champ, back to back player of the year and those types of things. Yeah, I mean, I think part of it is you don't know what you don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Probably if I would have understood the pressure. I mean, this is hard to imagine too, Phil. But think about this. There was no Facebook. Right. There was no Twitter. There was no social media. There was just the Omaha World Herald. <laughs> and, and so, you know, went to high school my freshman year. In freshman year of high school is a little rocky, but I think I started every game except for one game my freshman year. Yeah. And, but the reality is we weren't great. Mm -hmm. So you're starting, you're on a, a, a mediocre team. And then the summertime, you've got summer ball where you're traveling around, coaches are starting to recruit you. And so I had a pretty good summer between my freshman and sophomore year. And that's where Creighton, Coach Altman started looking at me. Kansas, when Roy Williams was there, yeah, uh, he was looking at me. And then Nebraska at the time. And I went on unofficial visits to actually all three of those schools. And it was the beginning of my sophomore year. I was starting to go to Creighton games. And this was the, this was the time Kyle Korver was at Creighton. I mean, Creighton right. was having some success. Yeah. There was a lot of momentum. And uh, it kind of, it happened really quickly, probably in a way that I would have never imagined to where uh, my, my, my sophomore year, you know, now, now I watch kids on signing day kind of sign these letters. I remember calling Coach Altman from school. Yeah. And uh, my coach was like, you know, you should tell Coach Altman that you're, you really want to go to Creighton. So I call him and I tell him during the middle of the day while school was going on. And then I'll never forget, I go home in about three or four o'clock that evening, I get a call from the Omaha World Herald. They're like, yeah, I heard you want to go to Creighton. And, and, and then the story comes out the next day, Dotzler signs with Creighton. I didn't even know I signed. Like, I didn't even know. <laughs> I was that committed to Creighton. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, and so the paper kind of made it official. And, uh, and then I would say over the course of the next couple of years, there was some other schools that came calling, but definitely felt Creighton was a school for me, just being local with the success Creighton was having. Um, there were a lot of things that just, it, it felt like it was the place I was supposed to be. Absolutely. Now, part of your story is consistent growth and uh, constantly being willing to push the boundaries to develop yeah. more. And going from being good in high school to college, it's just a jump. And not everyone that listens played collegiate sports, but yeah. just imagine, you know, 17, 18 year old you competing with someone, you know, five years older than you. Uh, that, that's just a big um, maturation stage. So talk a little bit about that transition for you from high school to college. And uh, you mentioned freshman year, some uh, adversity hit. Yeah, I think preparation is huge. And uh, I was fortunate to play for a coach in high school, Coach Woodard, who I would say is rivals many college coaches and, and beyond in terms of his just approach to the game. Yeah. I mean, at a, in, in high school, 
we were going to the gym before school started, after school started. I actually think I started doing two days in about seventh, eighth grade. Yes, sir. And, uh, and, and I remember back in fifth, sixth grade, my parents taking us to the Y at like six in the morning before school started. And so you start to kind of build those habits, the discipline. Uh, I think different people mentally have the capacity to make that jump because I think there's the physical side, but then there's the mental maturity yeah. inside. And I think even for me in high school, my first two years as a team, we didn't have a lot of success. Mm -hmm. My sophomore year, we had a really good regular season and then we got beat in districts by a team we had beat by 30 earlier. So there was a level of adversity yeah. that I think was helpful in our growth over the course of the next two years. Yeah. And, uh, and, and, and I will say this, that sophomore year after we got beat in districts, I'll never forget our coach bringing myself and another player into the room. And he, he, he said, Josh and, and Mike, he said, it's not a matter of if adversity will hit, it's a matter of when. Mm. And how you respond to that adversity is what matters. Yeah. And, you know, I thought he was only referring to basketball. <laughs> I didn't, you know, at the time, I, I didn't realize that there was adversity in other areas of life too. Yeah. But it's, it's one of those things that has stayed with me forever. And so, I mean, I really believe we grow the most when things are most difficult. Yeah. And, and so that season was hard. The next two years, I mean, we'd go 53 and three and uh, win back-to-back -back titles and, and would win a lot of awards and stuff. But I think that that sophomore year, freshman, sophomore year really helped prepare me for kind of that next season. And then the transition to college, because I had committed so early for three years before I got to Creighton, I would play with those guys. Yeah. And I would be up there at open gyms and I mean, they'd be beating me up and <laughs> their physicality. I mean, there's definitely a big difference. But I would say I was probably more prepared mentally and physically because of the way our high school coach approached basketball while we were in high school. And uh, so when I got to Creighton, honestly, I felt like my freshman year was one of the easiest years of basketball before I got hurt. Wow. The coach had kind of given me the keys to the team. We had a great team. We had guys who played in the NBA, played professionally overseas. Yeah. It just seemed to fit really easy. And then with six games left to go, we were playing against one of our rival rival schools and uh, stole the ball. Guy got just clipped me from the back. Random injury landed on my knee. Mm. Uh, at the time, partially tore my PCL. And PCL is an injury that normally you see in car accidents, right? Or you see it in uh, football, but never in basketball. And so it just it led down this road because people were unfamiliar with it. I tried to come back and then in practice, it was the last play in practice mm. before I was going to be shutting it down. I go up for a layup, a pop happens in my knee. I go off to the side and that would be me fully tearing my PCL. And uh, then kind of knew I, I would be out, but Bobby Newcomb, I don't know if you remember Bobby yeah. Newcomb, he tore his PCL, never had surgery. Mm. So some people actually never have surgery. And uh, so I went to see a specialist in Minnesota uh, right when I think school got out. And uh, he basically said, if you want to play, uh, if you want to play competitively anymore, you have to have surgery. Mm. So he sets it up. I get surgery the next day in Minnesota, Wow! like this special surgery, come back to Omaha. I have a straight leg brace on for the next six weeks. And uh, then would start the process of recovery, which was a whole nother thing because nobody really understood the injury. I tried to come back too fast. It should take about a year. I came back within six months, which just led to other compounding issues and challenges. Yeah. So something I want to highlight there is part of you growing up in North Omaha, you viewed basketball as a way that, Hey, if this thing goes really well, I'm, I may never have to go back to North Omaha. This could be, uh -huh kind of my ticket to whatever life I want to live elsewhere. And part of you, once again, viewed basketball as that way out, right? Hey, if college yes. can go as well as high school went. I mean, NBA or at least professionally overseas is an opportunity. Yeah. So talk a little bit about the mindset and the mentality that happens there when you feel like this is my ticket out and all of a sudden injuries start plaguing you and 
kind of changing what you're thinking might be possible yeah. from that. Big time. I mean, I grew up, I loved what my parents were doing. Yeah. I, I thought the work they were doing was great, but we also lived in a, in a community where neighbors were murdered, house was shot at. There was a lot of crime and violence. It instilled a ton of fear in me. And, and for many people who grow up in inner city communities, the goal is to get out yeah. and to move on. And for me, that was my, my goal. And I thought basketball would be that, that ticket out of the inner city for me. And I thought, you know, even if basketball didn't work out, I thought I'd get an education, Creighton University, yeah. and uh, find myself somewhere else. And so when, when part of it, when you're young, people will tell you, man, basketball won't last forever. Yeah. And it's, just, it's just something you can't even comprehend. I mean, it's, yeah. it's the thing that you've built your whole life around. And so when injuries started to happen, number one, it started to let me know that there's life after basketball. Yeah. This thing's not going to last forever. And especially, you know, my first injury with PCL was one thing. I had a lot of hope that I could come back, be the same player, but then it got compounded with breaking a finger and, and other injuries and, and ultimately even spending time in the hospital because of some medication I took that messed up my stomach and, I mean, I had to take medications just to be on the court. Wow. And uh, so you, you go through that pain and, and you start to realize, man, there's, there's, there's life after basketball. Yeah. And then number two, my junior year of college, 16 year old who grew up across the street was murdered. Yeah. And I'll never forget being at his funeral and just looking at his lifeless body. And, and, and I felt like God was asking me questions. And, and, and there was these seeds that were planted in me uh, saying, you know, what could you do to uh, see individuals like him to see their lives turn out different? How could you wow. be a solution? And, and it, was, it was one of those moments in my life where I would say the seeds of living on purpose and living for something beyond myself were planted and started to take root in a way that they just hadn't leading up to that point. Man, that that's powerful. That's impactful, right? Uh, having those those experiences close to home, people you know, you know, yeah. ha having that unfortunate event outcome. Now, one thing you said earlier was that you were quick to make the decision to uh, to enter into a college commitment. Well, you met a pivotal person while you were at Creighton that uh, you you were quick to move with too. So talk yeah. talk a little bit about uh, you know your your wife now, but how that kind of came to be in college. Yeah, I mean all of it. When you step back, you kind of almost laugh and you see kind of God's hand on everything. Yeah. And uh, my freshman year, uh, I met uh, my wife Jen, and uh, at the time. She, I have an older sister. She has an older sister who are friends and, and uh, her older sisters were trying to let her know, Hey, there's this cute guy I met. You need to get to know him. And she's like, you know, get, get away from me. She, she, she says, and I quote, he's ugly. And uh, she, she tells me she never looked at the picture that they were trying to show her. And, uh, but I always give her a hard time about that, but they were trying to like play matchmaker, hook us up. And eventually we met freshman year and um, we were dating, but, but it was really through my injury that really caused us to spend a lot more time together. And it was with the, you know, the revelation that, man, there's life after basketball. God had been doing stuff in my heart and, and really shifting some of my priorities. And um, it was one of those things where neither one of us would have envisioned getting married at a young age. Yeah. But we both felt like that was the decision that we were, God was calling us to make. And so we meet freshman year, we get engaged sophomore year, we get married going into our junior year, my junior year of college. And in hindsight, I mean, my sophomore, junior, senior seasons were, were some of the most difficult seasons for me athletically and, and just what it did to me in, from an identity perspective and in life. And, and going through that with her, I mean, having your best friend, I said, I had the best roommate somebody could ask for, <laughs> yeah. and, uh, obviously more than a roommate, yeah. but uh, met, met her. And really, I feel like that was the beginning 
of, I would say, a transition into just a new season, yeah. a new purpose, a new focus for, for me and, and for us in life. And now we've been married for 14 and a half years. We've got four children. And I'll never forget telling my, my coaches that we were going to get married. Yeah. And, and some of my teammates. My teammates were like, that's weird, dude. Like, why are you getting married? <laughs> my coaches were like, you know, who's forcing you to get married? What happened? Yeah. Uh, like in their minds, my focus on sports and basketball was going to go out the door. And long story short, I mean, my focus obviously was still there on basketball, but it, it was different. But I went from being an average student to an above average uh, student. Yeah. And uh, my coach would say today, man, Josh, if I would have known how you would turn out, I would have told you to get married a lot earlier. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's awesome. He definitely made me better in every way. That's awesome. So as, as we talk about that, once again, so basketball is starting to transition. We've seen adversity hit in the neighborhood, have yeah. a wife now, like things are starting to line up. As you go to graduate, uh, y- your dad talks to you and says, hey, you know, what do you think about joining the church and our mission with the, with abide? So talk a little bit, a bit about that and, you know, really um, your decision-making process around those things. Yeah. So when we were coming out, it was 2009 and uh, from an, uh, an economy perspective, a lot of businesses, organizations, you know, the the economy was struggling. People were on a hiring freezes. And so as we were transitioning out, our, our heart and, and kind of our prayer was, God, whatever door you open up, that's what door we'll walk through. Mm. And we, we were actually preparing to probably go overseas. Yeah. So we sold our car. I had a couple of, even though my, my athletic career wasn't great, I had a couple of teams overseas that wanted me to come try out. And so we were kind of preparing. We said, if that didn't work, maybe we'll go do some traveling there's a mission organization overseas that we had considered. So we were considering some of these options outside of Omaha. Yeah. Also had a job opportunity uh, with UP where basically they said, hey, we don't have anything right now, but in three months, we'll, we'll get back to you and uh, see what opportunities we have. So we had those. And then my dad was basically like, hey, as you figure out what you want to do, you can come kind of live on site where our kind of headquarters are. I'll pay you a whopping thousand dollars a month. And then you can kind of, you know, just figure out kind of what's next. Yeah. And um, so we, we did that a little hesitantly, probably my wife a lot hesitantly, (laughs) hesitantly, um, just because the, the whole situation was we were living at a place that was our ministry center. Also my parents' house. Also, it was one bedroom. It wasn't even like an apartment. And we had, we were on the eighth floor, basically in downtown Omaha for two years while we were married at Creighton. So it was definitely a step down from just some of the things that we had. And and so we went there and honestly, we literally thought it was going to be a short-term thing. Yeah. And uh, we ended up uh, getting pregnant with our first son, Joshua. And we had him while we were living there. And then we would end up moving into what we, what we consider now uh, our lighthouse uh, program. It was our first lighthouse other than where my parents were living. Yeah. And uh, so it was just kind of things started to unfold. And we, we just kept feeling like we were called to stay. And uh, there was a lot of things that, you know, people questioned her family. It was yeah. just hard to understand, you know, Josh graduated from Creighton, you graduated from UNO, you both have degrees, you're smart. Why would you move into this neighborhood? Why would you work for nothing? Why would you? And, and we couldn't always explain it. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and honestly, we didn't always like it. <laughs> to be truthful, yeah. we didn't always like it. But, but there was a sense of, it's almost like when you're doing a startup or when you're like in trying to build something, Yeah. there's a sense of, man, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. Mm-hmm. And I feel like I'm a part of something that's going somewhere. Yeah. I'm just not seeing the fruit of it yet. Yeah. Um, so that was, that was kind of the beginning of it. And, and really it was just kind of that process that led us to where we are today. Yeah. Now maybe let's dive into that for a minute. Uh, I think for a lot of people, there's two things that can be conflicting. One is what the people closest to them are saying to do versus what they maybe think they should be doing. And then second is that idea of, am I making the right choice? Right. Uh, 
a lot of people fear making the wrong choice. So talk a little bit about, you know, respecting the people in your life that are giving you feedback, but maybe not always uh, doing what they're saying. And then also, you know, just having conviction about, I, I'm, I believe I'm making the right choice. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I think number one, for many of us, you look at our relationships, our friendships, show me your five friends, I'll show you your future. Yeah. Our relationships definitely can help determine where we end up. I also think there's something that, you know, is called faith yeah. and something we strongly believe in. And faith is being sure of what you hope for, but it, and it's certain of what you can't see. Yeah. And so there's a, there's a reality to faith though, and stepping out because a lot of times the picture or vision you have for family or for business or for your neighborhood or community, isn't the vision that everybody else has. Yeah. And so they can't see what you can see. And so like, I think of our families, my, my parents, because they were leading it and a part of it and, and they had the vision for decisions we were making. So they were very encouraging, very supportive her family, they just had never been around anything like that. They just didn't have anything to attach it to and connect it to. And, and so I think you have to, you have to have people in your corner that are sounding boards that you can trust and get feedback from. But ultimately at the end of the day, you have to, you have to make decisions consistent with who you're called to be. Yep. And, and sometimes that means, man, I want to, I don't have to cut people off in my life. I can still love them, but I recognize that the perspective they have isn't the same perspective that I have. And the seat they're sitting in is different than the seat that I'm sitting in. Mm -hmm. So even if I had to go do it all over again, I probably would have appreciated other people's perspective better and recognize it's not that they're against me. They just don't understand the seat that I'm sitting in and the calling that's on my life. And so I think it allows us to give grace to people. It also allows us to say, hey, thank you. But this is where, this is the direction that I'm, I'm, I'm called to go. Um, what was the second part of your question that you asked though? Just, you know, having conviction that you're making the right choice, yeah. right? And, yeah. and being, I guess, finding peace in that choice, not always wondering, gosh, did I make the right choice or not? And, and, and I'll say this, that's been a hard one for us and for yeah. me because for years we've struggled is this the right choice? Is it not? Should we be here or should we, man, we're just still young enough. We could still go try something else and do something. I think a couple of things that have given us more freedom. Number one, in different seasons, life looks different. Yep. And so I don't think we ever have to attach ourselves to something. I think the mistake we make is, man, I'm doing this for the rest of my life. Um, Uh this, this, my identity becomes my position and, and I, I lose who I'm really called to be. Even for me in the seat that I'm sitting in now, man, if I'm called to go away and do something else or the door opens, I want to have the freedom to, to respond and say yes to that. And so we can't let our identity get in the way. The other thing is how we define our reality matters. Mm. And uh, I was just at a, a, a church service on Sunday and, and the pastor said, you know, there's the situation that happens to us but then there's the definition we give it Wow. and the story we tell ourselves. Yeah. And I think for, for far too long, man, I told the story of how hard it is to live in North Omaha and the challenges and the, and, and today the story is, Oh my goodness. Like God has been strategically doing something in our lives and positioning us and growing us. And even through the the hard times, those have been some of the greatest growth times and opportunities. And even where I'm at today, it's not about reaching an end destination, but it's about the process. And and so the story I'm telling myself and the definition I'm giving to my circumstances are are really, I would say, uh, they're just telling a different story to me. And uh, in different seasons, hey, let's have the freedom to make decisions, but also the freedom to change our mind. <laughs> and yeah. because life changes and, and life is dynamic. It's not static. That's great advice. I love that. So one of the decisions that you do end up making is your, your dad comes to you and says, hey, uh, maybe you should take another step in the church and uh, kind of take over the church. But there was a duo. It was you and another gentleman who was probably uh, not the typical person you would anticipate to run a, yeah. run a church with. So talk a little bit about that dynamic and you know why you felt led or called to step into that role. 
yeah. I mean, number one, I didn't feel led or, or called to do it. Yeah. Um, when I when I transitioned from Creighton and moved into where uh, we were living, uh, this other individual, Myron, was actually living in the same building, just got married, and he was in the basement. Yeah. I was straight out of, uh, of Creighton, and he came straight out of prison. Yeah. And uh, we we would go work out together every morning. And we go to 24 hour fitness and we'd be hanging out and then we work together through the ministry. And, and really we, we just developed this great friendship. Yeah. And, and he became a brother. And so as my dad was kind of ready to transition leadership, he asked Myron and I to co-lead together our church uh, bridge at the time. Yeah. And I was, I was more interested in leading with Myron than I was with becoming a pastor or yeah. leader. And so the fact that we could do it together, the fact that we could kind of grow together, made it made it something that was attractive and fun. And we used to always joke, who would have thought God would bring an ex Creighton and an ex-convict together <laughs> to, to lead a church? Yeah. And he was on parole for the first seven years of that church. I mean, we, we would always dream about going to travel the world <laughs> together after he got off parole. And um, so we did that for a while. Yeah. And uh, I mean, the, the, the truth is when you step into leadership, yeah. I was not ready to, to step into any level of leadership, especially leading a church, but it also does something. It, it starts to um, pull you up and, mm. and you start to rise to the level of expectation and leadership and responsibility. And so yeah. I started to, I would say, uncover some of the leadership, some of the gifts that God had put in me, yeah. that if I hadn't been put in that position, you know, I don't know that I would have ever fully discovered. That's I mean, great. I, I didn't like public speaking. Yeah. Uh, I mean, there's still always, you know, things that you struggle with, but I would say it's one of the things that I get the most joy out of today. Yeah. And uh, if I, if I hadn't stepped into that, that level of leadership or opportunity, and again, even taking the path of, of joining the ministry and church. And I, I don't know that I would have ever fully discovered that about myself. Absolutely. So simultaneously to running the church uh, abides growing. And, you know, you used a term earlier and I wanted to get described a little bit to, to the listeners. So you talked about a lighthouse and yeah. once again, you, you've got a fascinating story of, Hey, you know, we, my, my parents and, you know, abide as a whole decided, man, as different people move into this neighborhood, good things happen in certain parts of the neighborhood. There might be, you know, something to that. So talk a little bit about yeah. that topic there and what the lighthouses have done. Yeah, when, when uh, 2007, our family was living in this neighborhood, it was a couple of years before I got done at, at uh, Creighton, the police redlined this neighborhood as one of the most violent. Yeah. And, uh, and again, that was on the heels of our neighbor getting shot in the back four times and murdered and just a lot of crime violence activity. And, and our parents had bought this old abandoned building and fixed it up. And our family lived there. When I was 10, we moved there. It was the center for our mission. Then we started to buy a couple of other houses in that neighborhood, clean them up, fix them up. We started to hold some block parties. And so in 2009, this would have been right when I got out of college, Myron had been with the ministry for about a year the police came back and said, this neighborhood that was once one of the worst is now one of the best. And we'd love to know what your strategy is in revitalizing this neighborhood. Yeah. And at the time, there wasn't a formal strategy. There wasn't a three-part, four-part strategy. <laughs> yeah. It, it, it was just them living in the neighborhood, being intentional about doing some specific activities. And then one of the things that we always did from the beginning of our organization was bring in volunteers, yeah, mobilize influence to come in and whether it was help do cleanups, fix up houses, throw block parties. I mean, when volunteers come in, they can help you do more than you could do on your, your own. Yeah. And so we kind of, I would say, stumbled upon this neighborhood strategy that we started to implement after that. With the police, we identified the 735 most challenging blocks in North Omaha and we would say that we want to see this strategy happen in, in every single one of these neighborhoods. And the strategy centers around this, this concept of a lighthouse. Yeah. And a, a lighthouse is a, a home that was either once abandoned or once was the negative spot in that community that gets refurbished. 
And then the game changer for us is we put a family in that home that becomes the advocate in that neighborhood. Yep. And so they become the resource, the, the, the family that uh, connects those in the neighborhood to resources, the family that in that neighborhood, when something goes down, we've had, you know, shootings in a neighborhood and everybody goes to that lighthouse to seek refuge or to get counsel. So that lighthouse really becomes that anchor point in that community that really starts the process of revitalization in that neighborhood. Yes. And talk about what the police told you after these lighthouses continued to go up. It no longer was the, the uh, toughest part in the neighborhood. Right. Yeah. So in, in, in our neighborhood that we lived in, the first thing that we saw was they showed us a map of crime and, 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 and violence and uh, homicides. And they said, this neighborhood that you've adopted, you know, there's no negative activity. This neighborhood looks completely different. And over the years, as we've put more lighthouses in these neighborhoods, we've had different studies that have been done. And there's an estimated 75% crime decrease wherever we have a lighthouse presence. And so we, we know that this strategy works. And, and, and really, again, I mentioned earlier, the saying in communities like North Omaha is work hard, get an education, and you too can move out of the ghetto. Yeah. And so we're, we're just calling people to stay. <laughs> and be good neighbors. And, and we're trying to create a community of people that are committed to really the revitalization of the neighborhoods that they're living in. Absolutely. Now, an underlying theme in, in your life, Josh, has been you, you have to be in it to make a change. Yeah. And I think two of the topics that you, from the outside looking in, that you've really... Um, hunkered down on and said, I want to be in it is one, the community and living uh, where people don't want to live. But then two, uh, you know, over the course of the last, man, 18 months, two years, really in the racial conversation. And so yeah. talk a little bit about one, you know, you can do things from the outside, but how much more impactful it is to be in it and to have exposure to it opposed to just be, you know, a bystander from a distance trying to make a change. Yeah. I mean, we would say that presence matters. Mm. And you, you can't change something from a distance. Yeah. And so I think at the end of the day, whether you're on a team, building an organization, I mean, you have to be present. And, and in that presence, I think a couple of things happens. Number one, the, the, the idea of being proximate or in proximity yeah. allows you to really understand the challenges. And so like when it comes to the racial conversation or when it comes to the inner city uh, work yeah. that we're doing by living in the neighborhood, you see things, you understand things. You know, I tell people when, when, when you live in this community and you hear drive by shootings on a monthly basis, number one, that makes your prayer life go way up. <laughs> um, <Yeah. laughs> number two, that gives you a sense of urgency. Yeah. And we've got to do more. Right. When, 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 when you see young children, I mean, 10, 11 year olds or younger, eight year olds roaming the streets by themselves. Yeah. And they don't have places of safety. They don't have stability. There's a sense of urgency that says, man, we've got to provide more opportunity. Mm -hmm. We've got to develop more spaces. We've got to bring in more programming. We've got to bring in more people who can work with these individuals. So when you're proximate, you really understand the challenges. And, 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 and number two, I think you get a heart of compassion for the challenges that are present. Yeah, because when you're not connected to it, it's so easy to look at things from the outside looking in and say, man, if they would just do this, if they would just do this, if they would just do this. And so like even when it comes to the race conversation, living in North Omaha has really shifted and shaped the way I view the race conversation. Yeah, I tell people growing up, I mean, even on my basketball teams, if I were to be honest, a lot of the, 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 the kids that had the most challenges were from the black community. Yeah. I mean, they were always the ones I was yelling at, the coach was yelling at, they weren't on time, they were late, they were into stuff, they weren't taking care of their business. And you just wanted to be like, man, just straighten up. Yeah. But when we moved back to North, North Omaha, my wife and I, and you see the young children raising themselves, you see the lack of parental involvement, you see man, when you're in survival mode and you're just trying to find food or you're trying to make sure that you're not the target of a next drive-by, wow. Like you, right. you see that these young people are set up for failure from the jump. 
Wow. And you have this heart of compassion and you see the gap. So, so when you hear the black, the, the story of the black person who, who connects slavery to their current reality, you have a new perspective mm. on what it takes to be a part of the solution. Absolutely. So like for me, I think that the, the proximity highlights the challenges. I think for me, it's filled me with a level of compassion yeah. that I probably wouldn't have had before. And then I think it gives you some glimpses into potential solutions. Yep. And uh, ultimately, here's some things that can really be a part of, of changing the narrative moving forward. You and, bet. And, and I would say, again, like with the race stuff, yeah. some of it, God just positions you for certain seasons. Yep. I, I felt like the, the culmination of my life experiences, my dad being black or my dad being white, my mom being black, living in North Omaha, going to Creighton, yeah. living in North Omaha, going to other schools outside of the, the, the community, uh, doing the work that we do in the inner city, but partnering with a lot of organizations outside. It, like all those experiences, I think, prepared me and put me in a position to where the race stuff was just an extension of, of who I am. Absolutely. So to, to bring us to present day, you're, you run the church and things are going well, but you feel called to, Hey, I, I don't know that, you know, being the lead of the church is necessarily the, the route for me more getting a more active role in taking over abide is. So talk a little bit about how you made that choice, but then too, you know, how people today can be supporting abide in, in the mission you're on that we've been talking about. Yeah. I mean, I think to go back to even what I said earlier in different seasons, I think, you know, you can, you can do different things. Yeah. And I would say that my, my purpose personally is to maximize God given influence for maximum God sized impact. Yeah. It's, it's this hardcore belief that everyone has influence. And, and I believe God wants us to use that influence to impact the world around us. And so I was able to do that through the church. I'm able to do that through the nonprofit. They're two kind of different target audiences the biggest thing for, for, for me and for us was as those two were growing, organizationally, hmm. we were operating really as one organization, yeah. and we knew we needed to operate more as two organizations, yeah. more for sustainability purposes, personal sustainability <laughs> in terms of just what it was costing, and then also organizational sustainability. Yeah. And so the decision to focus on abide, to turn over bridge to another leader, uh, was really some just organizational conversations. And, and, and even with Abide, we purchased a, a, a campus uh, five and a half years ago. It's a 24-acre campus, the old Nebraska School for the Deaf. Yeah. It's required a lot of time and attention to really develop out that campus to be the hub for our Lighthouse community and for those that we're serving. And so it's been about two years, a little over two years since kind of my focus has been on Abide. And it's been a great season of really developing the ministry. I would say it was right before COVID and the race stuff. Yeah, And so uh, it allowed me to lean into the race stuff with COVID. It allowed us to distribute 100,000 meals in 20 wow. weeks, which was something that we weren't doing before. Yeah. And so we were able to, to pivot into that with just some of the resources that we have, partnerships that we have. Um, and then it's allowed us to carry on some of those things too. We put in, from COVID, we put in a food pantry in a computer lab uh, for for e learning and an activity center, and uh, you know we've been at, we we just finished up a uh, health and wellness fitness center this last spring, and so there's just been a lot of pieces that we've been trying to develop out that uh, has just taken a good energy and focus, and so in this season it's been great, and uh, yeah excited to keep keep developing it out. Absolutely. Well, Josh, I want to say thank you for being on today and sharing your story and the pivotal moments that have led you to where you're at. And uh, we're going to have to do this again in three or four on, years because who knows what's going to change <laughs> between now and then. And uh, we'll have to highlight the moments that have led to that. But I want to say thanks again so much. And uh, we'll include uh, in the show notes how to connect with Abide and how you can support, uh, you know, whether with your time or, you know, if you're not in uh, Nebraska and physically able to help, but if you're in a different country, different state, uh, support financially. So good. Phil, thanks for having me, bro. I love what you're doing. I love the theme of this podcast and what you're highlighting. And uh, we believe everyone has influence and want to encourage people to use it. Get in the game wherever you are, even if you're not in Omaha, Nebraska, use it because the world needs it. Awesome. Thanks so much, Josh.